verses 1 through 8. So we'll be looking at that this evening. So let's pray, and we will look at our passage. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all that you are doing, all that you've done, and, O oh Lord, in anticipation of all that you're going to do, we thank you. We thank you for your faithfulness, your goodness. We thank you for having mercy on us and showing us grace. Oh, Lord, we just thank you. Oh, how good you are. And, Lord, this evening as we look at Matthew chapter 10, Lord, I pray you'd speak to our hearts. That you would tell us what you want us to see what you want us to know, what you want us to take to heart. No, Lord, I pray that we would be more and more like you. Refresh us this evening. Strengthen us this evening. Fill us with your spirit this evening. Oh, how we need you. Guard us and keep us and watch us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So last week we finished chapter 9 by reviewing the miracles of Jesus that were recorded by Matthew. And then the chapter ended, chapter 9 ended with this summary. In chapter 9, verse 35 through 38, it says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And Matthew had just laid out for us the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. He had gone through all of that to show what Jesus was teaching and preaching. When we went through the Sermon on the Mount, he told us what it was that Jesus was teaching and preaching. And then after the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew gives a sampling of the miracles to show how Jesus was healing and to demonstrate for us the power of God through Christ's actions. And Jesus continued to teach and preach and heal. And it says that he saw the multitudes, all of these people, that Jesus could look at all of them and he could see all of the need. He didn't just see the surface. You know that. Jesus didn't see just the surface. But just as we saw in each of the encounters we reviewed over the past few weeks, Jesus would have seen so much more he saw all of the brokenness in heart and spirit. He saw all of the physical need. But even more than that, I know he saw the heart of all the need. The need that comes from the sin nature. These people who were neglected by the ones who were charged to be their shepherds. And were weary and scattered in heart, in mind, in purpose, in soul. So much need and with a heart of love that only the good shepherd could have, we are told that Jesus was moved with compassion to the utter depths of his own soul. As Jesus himself put it in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, when he was looking down on the city of Jerusalem, and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings but you were not willing. Jesus, the one who is at the very beginning of all creation, who spoke it all into existence, now walks among those confined to a fallen world who have no idea that the very God who created it all is walking right there in their midst. How his heart must have broke over and over again as he saw the effect of sin on the world that he had made. How he saw the effect in such a personal way with all of this multitude that thronged around him. And he sees them as they are, weary, scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. And he sees the need. And he says the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And he instructs us to pray for help. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And the next thing we see in chapter 10 is an answer to that prayer that continues to demonstrate the power of God in Christ. Because chapter 10, verse 1 starts with this, and when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out, 
and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now this is the first mention we have of the 12 that constituted the inner circle of disciples that spent these three years with Jesus. And we see right after the command to pray for laborers is recorded by Matthew in chapter 9, he then shows an answer to that prayer as Jesus sends laborers out. And now remember the context of what Jesus had asked us to pray. That the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers into his harvest. We are to pray that the Lord would send out laborers. And I read that the Greek is much more forcible in that language, but that it w the language is such that we are, should be asking that the Lord would push people forward into his harvest, that he would thrust them out to do the work. And it's the same word which is used for the expulsion of a demon from a man possessed. It takes great power to drive a devil out, and it will need equal power from God to drive a minister out to do his work. And I like that way of explaining what that, the heart of that prayer is. The strength <laughs> excuse me, it takes, and how we should be praying that God would put it so compulsively onto people's heart to go out and desperate to have the need to share his love with other people because the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. And here in Matthew chapter 10, he calls the 12 to him. He commissions them and he sends them. And the thing is, he doesn't send them out unequipped. And he doesn't do that to people he is called to go and do his work. It says that he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. And Jesus has shown that his authority is, is, wasn't confined to just the physical. We looked at all of his, his miracles. We saw that he had authority over the physical. He had authority over the spiritual. He had authority in every aspect of life, nature included. And here we see that his power is not just confined to himself, but he is able to pass the Spirit of God on to others to do the same works he was doing as he walked around. And he gave his disciples the power to perform the same works Matthew had just chronicled in detail. And so he didn't only call the twelve, but he also gave them power to do what he had called them to do. And the same principle holds true today. Whom God calls, God equips. And usually the equipping may not be completely evident before the ministry begins, but it will be evident along the way. So for Jesus to trust these guys with his work, with the Father's harvest, with these people that he had so much compassion for and pity on, when you look at where his heart was and you look at how he had equipped these men to go out and do that, to trust these guys with these sheep who he loved to the depth of these beings, then those 12 guys must have been pretty special, huh? They must have been some really upstanding guys deep in their seminary, deep in their theology, deep in their background of the Greek, deep in all of that. These must have been the cream of the crop, right? No, not so much, were they? Because as 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29 puts it, Paul says this, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen, <coughs> excuse me, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world. And the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. It has nothing to do with how great the guys were. Because it says, not many mighty, not many wise according to the flesh. Why? Because everything that has to do with the cross is foolishness in the flesh. But it's utter wisdom to God. All that's required is the Spirit of God into the move on the heart of people to be used by Him. Not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble. I'm glad that's there. God can use anyone 
who is truly willing to be his. And even with the case of the twelve, he was even willing to use one who ultimately betrayed him. Because chapter 10, verse 2, we have it, the record of who the twelve were. It says, now the names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Levius, who his surname was Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Now, one thing to note, this is the only time Matthew uses the word apostles in reference to the twelve. Apostle literally means one who is sent out like an envoy or ambassador, which makes sense in the light of the mission that they are being sent on. And there are four different lists of the twelve in the New Testament. And this one here, it's also recorded in Mark chapter 3, verse 16 through 19, Luke 6, verses 13 through 16, and also in Acts 1, 13. And these lists, in these lists, there are some interesting things Peter is always listed first, and Judas Iscariot is always listed last. There's two pairs of brothers, Peter and Andrew, James and John, and they're always the first four listed. <coughs> Excuse me, all of the lists record Bartholomew. Now, John doesn't record a list of the twelve, but he does call some out by name, and one he calls out is Nathaniel. In John 1, 43 through 51, and John 21, 2. Now, Nathaniel, whose name was Nathaniel Bar, Bar Telmai, Nathaniel the son of Telmai is what that would mean. Here in Matthew, his own name is shortened. He's called Bar Telmai or Bartholomew, which is what that means. So Bartholomew and Nathaniel are the same people. Thaddeus is also called by his other name Judas by Luke in both his gospel and in the book of Acts. And the lists are also arranged in a way that suggests that the disciples were organized into three groups of four, each with a leader. In each list, Peter is the first one mentioned, followed by Andrew, James, and John in differing order, but always in the first four. In each list, Philip is the fifth mentioned, Followed in differing order, but always in this grouping, followed by Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew. In each list, James, the son of Alphaeus, is the ninth mentioned, followed by Thaddeus, Judas, Simon, and Judas Iscariot. And so, who are these guys? Well, we're not given great detail about all of them. There's a lot that I'd like to know about them, but I'm sure we'll find that out in heaven. But they're not the focus of the Gospels. And Acts only gives the accounts of the ones Luke was with and then traveled with. And so what can we see? Well, let's go through them. Peter. Peter we know a lot about. A man who owned with Andrew, James, and John a fishing business. And he was the very vocal leader of the disciples with a mouth that, interestingly enough, seemed to be just the right size and shape for his foot. <laughs> he, James, and John made up the three that were closest to Jesus. And he is also the only one with enough faith, though, to walk on water with Jesus. As well as the one who, in fear, though, denied Christ in one moment, we see him declaring the G, that Jesus is the Son of God. And the next, he's being told to get behind me, Satan. So we see all of his successes. We see all of his failures. But out of all that failure came a wonderful picture of how gentle our Lord is in restoration. Once the Holy Spirit came, it, Peter developed into complete fearlessness. And so this imperfect, loudmouthed fisherman became a pillar of the early church and ultimately, according to extra-biblical accounts, led to his own willingness to become a martyr, being crucified upside down by his own request as he felt unworthy to be crucified as Christ had been. And then we have Andrew, the brother of Peter. And Andrew was a disciple first of John the Baptist. And in the Gospel of John, it's recorded how John and Andrew heard John the Baptist called Jesus the Lamb of God. And so they followed Jesus and spent time with him. After which, Andrew went to fetch Peter and told him that they had found the Messiah. And he brought Peter to Jesus. And later, 
in extra biblical accounts, we're told that he preached the gospel in many Asiatic nations. But on his arrival to Edessa, located in the northern area of present day Greece, he was taken and crucified on a cross, the two ends of which were fixed transversely in the ground like an X. And that's where we get the term St. Andrew's cross. And then we have James, the older brother of John, a son of Zebedee, also called James the Greater, to distinguish him from the other James, who's called James the Less. Nicknamed, along with his brother John, a son of thunder, because they were quick-tempered enough to want to call fire down on a village that had rejected them. James and John were cousins of Jesus. Their mother was first cousin to Mary, the mother of Jesus. And James was the first of the twelve to be martyred, beheaded by the sword at the command of Herod Agrippa. And then we know John, the younger brother of James, son of Zebedee, youngest of the disciples. He went from being a son of thunder to one who wrote on how much it means to love one another. And he was the only disciple that was mentioned at the cross during the crucifixion. And he was given the responsibility to look after Mary, the mother of Jesus, by Jesus during the crucifixion. He was miraculously spared from being boiled in oil and was banished to the Isle of Patmos and was given the revelation while there. And he founded the churches of Smyrna, Pergamos, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, and Thyatira. And he was the only one of the twelve to be spared a violent death. Then we have Philip. And here starts the ones that we don't know too much about. We do know that he was from Bethsaida. But then when Jesus found him in Galilee and called him to follow, that he went and found Nathanael, Bartholomew. And he shared with him that they had found him of whom Moses in the law had, and also the prophets wrote. And later he labored diligently in Upper Asia and suffered martyrdom in Helopolis in Phrygia in present-day Turkey. He was scourged, thrown into prison, and afterwards he was crucified. Then we have Bartholomew, who is also called Nathaniel, who was from Cana. Upon being told by Philip that he had found the one, and that it was Jesus of Nazareth, Bartholomew's reply was, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And when Jesus saw him, he looked at him and he said, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. And later he preached in several countries, and having translated the gospel of Matthew into the language of India, he propagated it in that country. He was at length cruelly beaten and then crucified by the idolaters in that area. Then we have Thomas called the twin. And when Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead, and the disciples are fearful because they know the Pharisees are after Jesus, he quips in an ever so cheery way, let us also go that we may die with him. Go team. <laughs> Best known though as Doubting Thomas, as he did not believe Jesus had rode again, rose again until he saw him for himself and said, I, until I can put my fingers in the holes of his, where the nails pierced him and my hand in his side, I'm not going to believe. And Jesus was so gracious with him. Because when he finally did see Jesus, what happened? Did, Tom, did he look at Thomas and go, loser, why didn't you believe in me? How do you like me now? No, he said, look, put your hands here. Touch me. Put your hands in the holes. Put your hand in my side. And what did Thomas say? Oh, my Lord, and my God. When he saw God, when he saw Jesus, he didn't doubt anymore. But later, he preached the gospel in Parthia, which is present-day northeastern Iran, and he also went up into India. He was martyred in India by the pagan priests who were enraged by the gospel, and they thrust him through with a spear. And then we see Matthew. And we've already talked quite a bit about him as we've been going through his gospel. He was a tax collector for the Romans in the Caesarea region. He was named Levi and given the name Matthew by Jesus. We we're told that he preached the gospel in Parthia and later in Ethiopia, where he was martyred with a halberd in the city of Nadaba, beaten, in essence, with a club until he was dead. Then we have James, the son of Alphaeus, or Cleopas, as he is also called. Called James the Less, as he was younger or smaller than James the son of Zebedee. And here is where it can get a little confusing. 
Three James are mentioned in the Gospels. James, the son of Zebedee, that we've already talked about. James, the son of Alphaeus. And James, the half-brother of Jesus. Now, confusing it further, both James, the son of Alphaeus, and James, the half-brother of Jesus, had mothers named Mary, which was an extremely common name at the time. And both Marys were at the crucifixion. And the Marys were also sisters, which made James the less and Jesus cousins. James the greater, the son of Zebedee, was martyred early on by Herod Agrippa. James, the half-brother of Jesus, became an apostle and leader of the early church on par with Peter and wrote the epistle of James. He was called James the Just. And in Matthew 12, it's mentioned how mother, brothers, and sisters of Jesus wanted to speak with them, but Jesus was with the multitudes and did not go out. And it's intimated that the brothers of Jesus did not believe or follow him until after the resurrection. James the just was martyred by being thrown from the top of the temple. The fall didn't kill him, so then they beat him to death. Now, James the less, the one that we were talking about here. James the less was beaten and then stoned and finally had his brains dashed out with a fuller's club. I look at all that, I don't know if I want to be named James. <laughs> all three James were martyred there. Then we have Thaddeus, who's also called Judas the brother of James the Less. Now, we don't know much about him either, other than, he, other than that he was crucified in Edessa for preaching the gospel. We have Simon, the Canaanite. Not the pagan kind of Canaanite, but it means a man from Cana. He was also known as Simon the Zealot. Now, what was a zealot? A zealot was a political rebel against Rome trying to fight for the liberty of Israel. Now, they were known to mingle in crowds and assassinate people with a dagger, and then disappear back into the crowd. Simon preached the gospel in Mauritania, on the west coast of Africa. And later, it's recorded that he actually got all the way to Britain, where he was crucified. And then we have Judas Iscariot. Now, Iscariot is usually thought to mean a man of Kerioth, a city in southern Judea. But it's also been explained as meaning traitor, assassin, carrier of the leather bag, or redhead. Which exactly it meant, we're not sure. But even the one who was to be the betrayer of Jesus was endued with the power of the Holy Spirit and sent on this mission that's recorded in Matthew chapter 10. But in his failure and his falling away and his betrayal of Christ, just think how miserable his eternity must be. Which is why I think it said that it would have been better if he would have never been born. So these are the twelve. Sent out to be harvesters. To tend to the weary and scattered sheep who elicited so much compassion from Jesus. They were given power, these not so mighty men. Four were fishermen. One was a tax collector. One was a zealot. And we don't know what the others were. All just ordinary men. Not the educated elite, not the high and lofty, just guys. In fact, men that in everyday life would not necessarily have been around each other. A tax collector from the region that collected from some of these men. A zealot who valued freedom more than life and was willing to fight to overthrow Rome. If Simon and Matthew would have met on the street prior to being disciples of Jesus, Simon probably would have stabbed Matthew as a traitor to Israel. And yet Jesus brings them all together and charges them to go tend to these sheep that he loves. They went from men who would argue over trivial things and run in fear when Jesus would face the cross to loving Jesus and others enough to lay down their own lives for the sake of the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29, for you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. These men all learned what it meant to be a shepherd. In chapter 10, verse 5, it says, These twelve Jesus sent out 
and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now Jesus didn't command them to do this out of spite or hatred or lack of love for anyone but Jews, but he did know that the gospel was for the Jew first, and then it went out to the Gentile. He also knew that if the disciples went out to the Gentiles now and then came back, the Jews would want nothing to do with them. Regardless, the time for the gospel to go to the Gentile was coming and ordained by God and praise the Lord, he did have a time and a plan for that too because that's where all of us fit in. But they were sent, these disciples were sent to the lost sheep of Israel and that is where they went, to the sheep weary and scattered, needing a touch from Jesus. In chapter 10, verse 7, it says, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Jesus sent them to go and to do and to say the same things he had been doing and saying. Not putting more burden on the people, but letting them know that the kingdom of God was at hand and what the kingdom of God looked like. And as freely as the power was given to them, they were to freely give out the same. The thing that I cannot get over, though, is the likeness to sheep. Jesus equates them and us. One of my favorite books is called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23 by W. Philip Keller. I read that book every year. It's not that long. It's a good book. It's powerful, though. It's called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23 by W. Philip Keller. He was a shepherd, he was a pastor, and he has, so he has a very unique view and insight into the 23rd Psalm. And in it, he says that sheep do not just take care of themselves, as some might suppose. They require more than any other class of livestock, endless attention and meticulous care. Guess what? That's us. <laughs> sheep. Do not just take care of themselves, as some might suppose. They require more than any other class of livestock, endless attention and meticulous care. It is no accident that God has chosen to call us sheep. The behavior of sheep and human beings is similar in many, many ways. Our mass mind or mob instincts, our fears and timidity, our stubbornness and stupidity, our perverse habits are all parallels of profound importance. Yet despite these adverse characteristics, Christ chooses us, calls us by name, makes us his own, and delights in caring for us. And in it, he goes on to list three reasons that we belong to Jesus. And that I belong to him simply because he deliberately chose to create me as the object of his own affection. I belong to him simply because he has bought me again at the incredible price of his own laid down life and shed blood. And I recognize his ownership of me because he literally lays himself out for us continually. He is ever interceding for us by his gracious spirit. He is ever working on our behalf to ensure that we will benefit from his care. Jesus demonstrated that while he walked the face of the earth, And he instilled in these men who had no clue what their ultimate call would be how to shepherd a flock. These men went from caring about themselves and the position in the group that they wanted to hold, caring about, they went from that to caring about others to the point that they were compelled to go into the harvest and even lay down their very lives for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are to pray that the Lord would send out laborers forcibly, compulsively, that he would push them forward and thrust them out, that the power of God would drive people to minister to the sheep that are without a shepherd, to the ones that need his touch so desperately. The disciples, it ended up that they could not help but go. Even at the cost of themselves, they learned from the good shepherd what it means to be a shepherd. And they also learned from the sheep that the sheep were worth it to Jesus. That's what they learned. It took the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives 
to be able to see that and have it get through that. It took the day of Pentecost to come for them to know what it was to be called by Christ. And we are to be praying for that same compulsion. And as we do, the thing we have to remember is our willingness to be that person. How willing are you to step into the gap for other people? How willing are you to be able to be one that the Lord would use to minister to other people? How willing are you when you look at the requirements to be one that is able to go do that or is called to go do that? I think we all fit in there. Not many mighty, not many noble, not many wise are called. It doesn't matter who we are, what we've done, our many, many failures, like Peter, our many, many successes, our betrayals of Christ. It doesn't matter. What matters is what you're willing to let Christ do in you now. And we look at these guys, 12 ordinary guys. One failed absolutely completely, Judas Iscariot. The other 11. And then Paul the Apostle after them. We see all that they did. It's all recorded for us to see. And now the Spirit of God will use those who are willing to be used by Him for His glory and for His kingdom's sake. I'm so grateful that the Lord is my shepherd. I'm so grateful that He is my King and my God. I'm so grateful for all that He's told us about Himself so that we could know all it takes is a willing heart. All it takes is a willing heart. And I look at the lives of those guys and I have hope because he used them so mightily, so mightily, even, even despite who they are. And he can do the same through any of us if we're just willing. Lord, I pray that we would be willing to be used by you. Oh, Lord, I pray that. Lord, I'm willing, help my unwillingness, help my willfulness. But, oh, Lord, may we be willing to be used by you for your glory, for your kingdom, and for the sake of the sheep that you laid your life down for, for the sake of the ones who need you so desperately, for the sake of the ones who are burdened, and broken for the sake of the ones who are weary and have no hope for the sake of the ones who need to know your love so desperately and the freedom that comes from submission to Jesus Christ Lord may we be willing to love you enough to love other people it's easy as we go through life to just be so caught up in what we have to do. And there's things we have to do. The hustle and bustle of life is real. But, oh, Lord, may we not miss what you want us to do along the way. And we trust you. Fill us with your spirit. Use us for your glory. And may we bring you pleasure, Lord, as we walk with you. May we be faithful to you. We praise your name and we glorify you, our God and our King. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name master savior jesus like the fragrance after the rain jesus 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim 
kings and kingdoms shall all pass away. But there's something about that name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Have a good week, ladies. There's prayer tomorrow. And don't forget Sunday, potluck and communion. God bless you guys. Have a good week. Savior, I come, quiet my soul. Everything.